Well, uh, thank you for tuning in to the weekly broadcast of the Alliance for Unity. I uh, would like to thank the 60,000 people who watched last Monday's broadcast. Although that's a drop in the ocean compared to the half a million people who watched my mother of all talk shows last night live, and I'll not be satisfied until these two audiences are more closely uh, aligned. However, I can tell you uh, that this evening we just passed the 11 millionth read of our tweets in just nine weeks. I think uh, you could uh, agree with me that that is uh, a pretty substantial uh, number of people who are reading about the Alliance for Unity. Uh, far more than people are writing about the Alliance for Unity. And that's one of the issues that I will touch on in this evening's broadcast, how to break out of the glass case in which uh, our efforts uh, have hitherto been uh, restrained or constrained. Because, uh, of course, there are a lot of vested interests in uh, business as usual. Uh, in the same old, same old, uh, the three big unionist parties uh, cutting each other's throats and allowing the SNP to form government after government after government with a minority uh, of the vote. And that's another of the themes that I'm going to uh, stick to uh, this evening, uh, that the SNP does not speak for Scotland. And there are a significant number of people in England and internationally, I dare say, who are not quite aware of that, who appear to be oblivious to the fact that the last time the issue of separatism was tested in Scotland, the separatists were soundly beaten uh, by today's standards, 55 to 45 uh, constitutes a thrashing in a poll which 85% of the people participated in. So when you see and hear, as we do all day and every day, uh, people affecting to conflate uh, the SNP with the Scottish people, we constantly must make this point that the Scottish people, if it means anything, means the Scottish majority. And that majority wants to remain in Britain. Not only that, but 55-45 was also the result uh, at the last Scottish Parliament election. As a matter of fact, the SNP have never, ever got more than 50% of the vote in any Scottish election. And if you factor in those that didn't vote, uh, then they are actually speaking for a little over a quarter uh, of the Scottish people. So never allow that contention of theirs, that they are Scottish, uh, that they speak for Scotland, to go unchallenged. Neither, uh, to put it the way I did in a tweet this week, allow them to deracinate us. I am Scottish, uh, of Irish background, and no one can take that away from me, however hard they try. Uh, they cannot deracinate me, neither can they excommunicate me uh, from my faith or my football team, uh, as I pointed out. Always contest these uh, narratives. Uh, when they tell you you are not welcome at Celtic Park, uh, as they tell me all day, every day, uh, tell them I'll be there, uh, whether you like it or not. When they tell you to uh, move to England, tell them you are as Scottish as they are, uh, whether they like it uh, or not. And as a matter of fact, as I've just said, we speak for the majority. So I suppose I'm asking for a bit more confidence, a bit more oomph uh, from the pro-British Scottish population. Uh, I know why, because of the cyber nat swarms uh, and worse. Uh, that are out there that sometimes people think discretion is the better part of valor. But if we all come out, as I'm encouraging you increasingly to do, uh, then it will uh, quickly be seen that there are strengths 
there is a strength in numbers, and numbers are on our side. The latest poll, and bear in mind the two previous polls, were not actually polls. They were panel-based uh, surveys, and you can only participate in a panel-based survey if you've already signed up to the panel, uh, which is a self-selecting uh, measure uh, before you even start. Uh, but in the latest poll, uh, the uh, SNP lead was uh, not 55%, but 53%, uh, but only if you exclude the don't knows. If you include the don't knows, and bear in mind uh, that in 2014, at the referendum, uh, the don't knows broke for us, for no, uh, by a huge proportion, more than five to one, uh, broke our way in that uh, election, then there isn't a majority at all in the latest opinion poll. So please, contest all these fake narratives uh, as they come up and raise uh, the contradictions uh, that exist in the coronavirus, for example. How many days did Nicola Sturgeon on her daily party political broadcast masquerading as a health public health report, uh, did she talk about how uh, Scotland was doing far better than England? Five times better, she used to regularly claim. This was either a lie or uh, a piece of arithmetic uh, that would shame a primary school child, even in Scotland's now fading uh, education system. This was never true. Uh, Scotland has the third worst coronavirus outcome in the entire world, in the entire world. And the number of our old people sent to die, euthanasia, uh, in our care homes uh, is a national shame uh, that will never be forgotten and must never be forgiven. But as the R rate is now officially higher in Scotland, than it is in England. Why do we hear nothing uh, from Nicola Sturgeon about closing the border so that we don't pass this hideous disease, this virus, onto the people of England in the way that she repeatedly threatened to do in the other direction? You can uh, be sure uh, that there will be no goons uh, on the English side of the border, uh, holding up uh, banners telling the Scots to get out of England uh, or, in more colourful language, to get the F out of England. That will not happen because uh, England does not have uh, this uh, sickness uh, of the separatist uh, disease uh, of uh, seeking always uh, to uh, show one upmanship, or worse than that, some kind of racial superiority uh, towards the rest of the people uh, in this small island. But these are just some uh, preliminary thoughts. I want to go on to what are the two main themes of what I want to say to you uh, tonight. The first thing is that the decision of the Shetlands Council uh, by 18 votes to two, and the decision of the council in Orkney uh, to do the same uh, is a significant game changer in the anti-separatist campaign that we are running. The Shetland people have decided to explore uh, by a vote of 18 to two, uh, refusing uh, to follow uh, Scotland into any separatist future in the unlikely event, unlikely and melancholy event that that were to transpire. Uh, the Shetland people have the absolute right of self-determination. I'm going to show you a number of petards on which the SNP argument is hoist, and I begin with this one. Uh, the people of the Shetlands have the absolute right of self-determination. And in any case, the SNP, which can't build two ferries, 
uh, is not in a position to build a navy uh, to enforce uh, their uh, hegemony over uh, the Shetland Isles. Neither uh, will the non-existent Scottish Air Force or Scottish Army be in a position to do anything about it. The Shetlands uh, was never actually given to Scotland, was actually presented by the King of Denmark and Norway uh, uh, at the time, uh, presented to uh, King James III as in lieu of a dowry on the marriage of his daughter uh, to uh, King James III. Uh, thus, uh, this territory belongs to the crown. And if the people of Shetland were to decide uh, that they were going to exercise their right of self-determination and remain with the crown, uh, there is not a damn thing uh, that the SNP in Edinburgh could do about it. In fact, uh, we, Ag Agnes McNeil, uh, the, uh, the SNP MP, has already publicly opined that if uh, this uh, demand for uh, self-determination in Shetland were uh, strong enough that the SNP would not stand in its way, because uh, they could not stand in its way, neither morally, intellectually, legally, or in the last resort, intellectually. Now, why is this significant? It's significant for this reason. It's my thesis that the only way that Scotland can remain united is by remaining in the United Kingdom. For many, many centuries, indeed millennia, uh, Scotland was not a single country. It was a country broken into uh, principalities and uh, the terrains of uh, warlords of one kind uh, or another, of uh, many backgrounds, Scots, Picts, Gales, and so on. It's actually been a unified country almost as long in the Union as it ever was outside of the Union. And the only way Scotland can remain a united country is to remain within a united kingdom. And then, if I may en passant, add that as the oil, if it's anybody's, other than Esso and BP and the multinational oil companies that actually own it, but this oil is, if it is anybody, Shetland's oil. And so the chimera uh, of an oil bonanza in a separatist Scotland disappears like the morning mist, the day and hour that Shetland departs uh, from the purview uh, of the uh, government in Edinburgh. But more than that, once Shetland had insisted on its right of self-determination and, uh, and flown the coop, it's highly likely uh, that the Orkneys would do the same. And if the Orkneys and the Shetland Isles had done so, how long before the superior tendencies would arise in unvanquishable number in those places that did vote and would again vote in overwhelming numbers against leaving Britain, especially after this coronavirus crisis and the grotesquely unfair way uh, that Aberdeen was treated uh, by Nicola Sturgeon, by comparison, for example, with her treatment of the city of Glasgow, it's highly likely that the oil capital on the mainland would also exercise its right, at least demand to do so, that it too should be included out. And if that's true, what about Edinburgh? What about the city of Edinburgh? Uh, what about Dumfries and Galloway and the borders? I can't speak with any certainty uh, about the settled will of the people of Orkney and Shetland, but I think I can speak.
speak with reasonable certainty about the view of the people in Dumfries and Galloway. It's my belief, we'll see at the elections in May, but it's my belief uh, that there are no circumstances in which Dumfries and Galloway will be dragged out of Britain against its will. And therefore the possibility of redrawing of borders all over Scotland uh, could very well be the result. You see, the lesson of Yugoslavia is uh, that uh, self-determination, separatism, doesn't necessarily stop where you want it to stop. Once you have uncorked the bottle and the genie is out, uh, then you will have no leg to stand on if people in uh, parts of Scotland that vote overwhelmingly against separatism say, well, we're not going to accept this and we call on the British state uh, to which we are loyal uh, to come to our aid. And then you get what I've called the Ulsterization uh, of Scottish politics, which is the second subject I want to deal with this evening. I appreciate this issue is uncomfortable for some, uh, but for those like me on the receiving end of it, I have to tell you that there is a disturbing parallel in invective, a propaganda, abuse and even threats uh, in Scotland that reminds me of the darkest days uh, in the situation that prevailed until uh, 20 years ago uh, in Ireland. In fact, it's almost like as the war ended in Ireland, a cast of people, people like me, from my background, I decided to pick up, if not yet the Armalite, then pick up the rhetoric of the Armalite, the mindset of the Armalite, and continue the war in Scotland. The fact that there is no war now in Ireland, and that peaceful and democratic routes uh, are now well established, and that power sharing and so on uh, exists, that such rhetoric should be used with such regularity and venom in Scotland is a highly dangerous thing. And this flows from the fake narrative, which is my third topic this evening, the fake narrative of Scotland as an occupied country. All day and every day I read these words, an occupied Scotland, an oppressed Scotland, an imprisoned Scotland, a shackled Scotland, uh, uh, Scotland's imperial masters. And this kind of anti-historical, arrant nonsense is not just intellectually an atrocious offense against thought and logic and reason, it too is dangerous. Because, of course, if you really were occupied, shackled, imprisoned, under the iron heel of a colonial master, well, you would have every right a moral right and even a legal right to rise up against your occupier and by force of arms uh, seek to drive them out. That would be your moral and your legal right if any of that were true. Now, it's true that it's only at the absolute margins. Uh, there's an allegation now against uh, prominent uh, Yes campaigner, uh, funnily enough a member of the Green Front 
uh, in the SNP Green Party government. Uh, there's an allegation, only an allegation, and a very contentious one at that. Uh, but that this uh, this uh, prominent yes campaigner, a Palestinian no less, uh, had uh, joined up with uh, the so-called uh, real IRA, continuity IRA, uh, and had spoken at their meetings and uh, was attending their secret uh, sessions. These are only allegations, and they are denied uh, by the individual concerned. Uh, but if they were true, uh, that would be the first time for a long time uh, that, uh, that any Scottish nationalist extremist linked up with uh, anti-peace, anti-peace process, Irish elements, and operating in Scotland. The individual is in prison in Northern Ireland now, but was arrested in Edinburgh. But although there's not been any cases of this, there are people who regularly promise it or threaten it uh, on social media. I've reported several of them to Police Scotland. People who talk openly about a, a war that's coming, a civil war that's coming. Uh, now this I don't have to labor uh, to you. Is of course the path to austerization and absolute ruin and destruction in Scotland. Uh, because, of course, uh, were any such development to take place, it would be answered. It would be answered by people uh, in Scotland who remain loyal to, uh, to Great Britain, but it would also be answered by the British state. And God forbid that we go any further down that Road. So it would be very helpful if the separatist fanatics could drop this pretense that they are somehow fighting the Irish war in Scotland. Uh, they are not. The Irish war is over. And for you to pretend that you are fighting it in Scotland and that you are adopting the mantle uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the Irish Republican cause is not just uh, monstrous, a monstrous distortion of the truth, uh, but is highly dangerous. And it should stop before it goes any further. But it's not just arrant, historical, anti-historical nonsense. It is actually a real insult to those who are actually occupied, oppressed, shackled, and under the iron heel. It is an insult to every person in the world who does not have the right, endlessly the right, to vote for people who have that endless right. Uh, to describe themselves in that way. We are never done voting. You don't get to vote if you are living under the iron heel. If you are shackled, you cannot put an X on the ballot paper. You cannot march from here to there uh, waving your flags. You cannot stand on bridges distracting the drivers. You cannot uh, be doing the kind of things uh, that the separatist movement is doing. And above all, you cannot govern in a devolved assembly if you are truly oppressed, shackled, occupied. It is an insult to every person in the world who is living in those circumstances uh, for Scots to pretend it's a kind of masquerade. I don't know if it makes them feel more romantic, more dashing, uh, or what. You are not freedom fighters. There is no need to fight for freedom in Scotland. In fact, only six years ago, you were given on a silver plate in far more conducive circumstances than exist today. 
you were given on a silver plate the right to vote for separatism and your compatriots comprehensively, decisively rejected it. Moreover, you've gone on to vote several times since. You can speak freely. You can vote freely. You can associate and congregate freely. Stop insulting those in this world who cannot uh, do so. So, this narrative of Scotland as oppressed, occupied, is, as I've said, arrant nonsense. And it's time to restate some simple facts. Uh, the Union was requested not by England but by Scotland. Scotland was not colonized but Scotland colonized plenty of other places. Indeed, in the greatest irony of all, it was the collapse of a Scottish colonial adventure uh, in Central America which led to the need for Scotland to request union with England to avoid trade wars, to bail out the quarter, 25% of all Scots who had invested their money in that colonial adventure. Scotland embraced uh, the British imperial era not just <laughs> warmly, but with gusto. The swirl of the kilt, the skirl of the bagpipe, trust me, I know, was seen and heard by hundreds of millions of people in the world that actually were colonized. Britain colonized a third of the world. And Scotland was in the vanguard of that colonization. So don't talk to me about Scotland being somehow uh, the victim of imperial aggression. The precise opposite is true. I've had many friends, even in-laws, uh, that were under an iron heel all right in the British colonies under a Scottish iron heel in the British colonies. Far from being oppressed, the British government is throwing money at us like Billy O. More money at us than at any other part of uh, this kingdom. Imagine that. You're so oppressed. You're so shackled. They're stuffing 2,000 extra pounds down our throats every year, every year than they are the poor people of Newcastle, Liverpool, Yorkshire, Lancashire, the South West, South Wales. 2,000 pounds a year more these dastardly colonists are stuffing down our throats. The truth is Scotland would have Collapsed twice in the last 12 years. Collapsed in total national bankruptcy. Like we did when we asked for the union in 1707. We would have collapsed in bankruptcy. National ruin in 2008 and again during this coronavirus crisis. I'm being told I've spoken for half an hour. I was just getting into my stride. But that will probably do uh, for this evening. Let's try and beat last week's audience of 60,000. Please share this as widely as you can. Have a good evening.